The friends of a Lawrence teenager charged with beheading a classmate say they heard his confession. Today in court, the friends testified that Matthew Borges originally planned to rob Lee Valoria Paulino, and then admitted to killing him. And Emily, the district attorney calls this a horrific murder. And at today's arraignment, we expect to learn more about exactly what happened. 16-year-old Lee Paulino is being remembered by his family as a loving teenager who was active in his church. He'd been missing for two weeks. And Thursday, his mutilated, decapitated body was found along the banks of the Merrimack River. It is just a gruesome crime that has troubled this community. And people are coming tonight to try to comfort his family. Just everybody's, you know, grateful to have everybody in there, you know, and trying to be positive, but it's, it's horrible. Everybody's crying. There's no way to really describe it. It's just, I don't know, it's sad. Did he tell you why he stabbed him in the throat? Yeah. Why did he say that? Um, because, um, he wouldn't shut up. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the case of Lee Manuel, a 16-year-old high school student living in Lawrence, Massachusetts, who would sadly have his life cut far too short. Lee Manuel was your average teenage boy who enjoyed spending time with his family and friends. He lived in a multi-level home with many of his family members, including his grandmother and uncles. He was close with his mother, had a reputation for knowing how to quickly put a smile on the faces of those around him, and was naturally good at making friends. On the night of November 18th, Lee's mother, Katiuska Paulino, was in the Dominican Republic and wasn't home. It was then that Lee's uncle, Samuel, noticed two individuals in the backyard and even attempted to confront them. However, those two individuals quickly walked away and because it was dark at that time, his uncle failed to get a good look at them. When he entered the home, he noticed the door to the second level of the property, where Lee lived with his mother, was open. Out of curiosity, Samuel went over to Lee's door, knocked, and didn't get a response, which caused him to feel concerned, especially since he'd noticed those suspicious individuals in the backyard. The grandmother and Samuel would then attempt to open his door using a butter knife, only to find that Lee wasn't inside the room. At first, they believed he snuck out for the first time, so they decided to wait around for him. In fact, Samuel even set up a booby trap because he thought it would be funny for Lee to come walking through that door in the middle of the night, waking everyone up by knocking over a bunch of pots and pans. However, the humor in the situation would quickly turn into significant concern because Lee never returned that night. Samuel and Lee's grandmother were so concerned they contacted the police to report him missing on November 19th. They knew this was out of the ordinary behavior for Lee, who wouldn't just randomly go missing without telling someone where he was going. Unfortunately, the Lawrence Police Department thought otherwise believing that Lee's disappearance was simply your typical teenage runaway case. Perhaps he'd left the home after an argument with a family member and didn't want to come home. While Lee's family knew this wasn't the case, there wasn't much more they could do to get the police heavily involved in the disappearance of their relative. To help spread the word, the family contacted local news stations and passed out flyers while encouraging Lee's many friends to raise awareness of his disappearance on social media, which they did. Because he was such a popular kid, Lee had hundreds of people looking for him. The local police department would eventually review surveillance footage from around the Valoria's home on the evening of November 18th, the last time anyone had heard from Lee. In the footage, police observed Lee leaving his home with another male, heading in the direction of the Merrimack River. It was then believed that the two individuals that Samuel saw that night were Lee and the other person he was with. While investigators didn't initially know who it was walking with Lee that night, they brought the footage to Lawrence High School, where Lee was a sophomore. The principal of the school reviewed the footage and named the other individual in the footage, Matthew Borges, a 15-year-old Lawrence High School student. 
Now that investigators had a name to go with the face, they decided to take a visit to Matthew's home to ask him a few questions about that night. During that initial interrogation, Matthew claimed he and Lee met up to smoke marijuana, which they did by the river, and then went their separate ways. He claimed that Lee was alive when they parted ways and didn't know where he could possibly be. Matthew initially met Lee at school. Lee was popular and knew nearly everyone in his and other grades. If you asked one of Lee's friends if he and Matthew were friends, they would likely tell you no. However, in the weeks leading up to their meeting on November 18th, the two were texting one another more often than before. It's now believed that Matthew was potentially attempting to act like a friend to Lee in an attempt to lure him out of the home so that he and his friends could rob him of his gaming console, essentially teaching him some sort of lesson because Matthew felt Lee was flirting with a girl he was dating, Stephanie Soriano. So while Matthew went out with Lee for a smoke to distract him, his friends had actually broken into the second level of the home where Lee and his mother lived. The goal was to take his name brand clothing, belts, and electronics. It appears these individuals were jealous of what Lee had and wanted to take it all away from him. Even with this information, the case started turning cold. Lee was nowhere in sight and the police didn't have a clue as to what could have happened to him after he went on that walk with Matthew. In fact, Lee's family felt disgusted by investigators' actions, or lack thereof, believing they weren't doing enough. Because the Lawrence area is heavily populated with gang members, Lee's family believed that local law enforcement assumed he'd left of his own accord and possibly even joined a gang rather than consider the possibility that something more malicious may have occurred. Not willing to accept that as a possibility, Lee's family continued attempting to get the word out there because they wanted the world to know that their loved one was missing. On December 1st, 2016, a man was walking his dog down by the river, which he did quite often. On that walk, he noticed what appeared to be a body in the water, with part of it sticking out and visible enough for the naked eye to see. He immediately called 911 to report his findings. Upon arriving at the scene, first responders determined the body in the river was that of a young man wearing a black t-shirt and sweatpants. As they got closer, they realized the person was missing his head and hands. While still by the river conducting their investigation, authorities noticed a market basket bag floating in the river, roughly 50 yards away from the body. A homicide detective grabbed two long sticks from the ground and used them to gently reel in the bag, just to see what might be inside of it. Lo and behold, when the detective opened the bag, they noticed a human head inside of it. Although they continued to look for additional remains, unfortunately, they never found his hands. The body found by the Merrimack River was later identified as Lee Manuel Viloria Paulino, the missing 16-year-old from Lawrence. During the autopsy, the medical examiner noted that Lee had been stabbed 76 times throughout his body, all with the same knife. Both his head and hands had been sawed off, but the medical examiner could not identify with what object someone may have done such a horrific thing. So, who would want to murder this seemingly popular and charismatic young man? 16-year-old Lee Manuel Villori, as you mentioned, missing for two weeks. The high school sophomore was last seen on November 18, leaving his grandmother's house around 6 in the evening. Relatives searching for that boy ever since, including along this stretch of the Merrimack, where a headless body was found Thursday afternoon. The teen's severed head was recovered nearby. Lee's family, suspecting the worst, was frustrated by the lack of information, paralyzed by the uncertainty. A little while ago, I spoke with the teen's dad and his loved ones shortly after the brutality of this crime was confirmed. Did reaction to your worst fears? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I can't talk to nobody right now. My condolences. Thank you. Going back to the last person to be seen with Lee, Matthew Borges wasn't as popular as Lee. Most would describe him as someone who had quite a temper. In fact, at one point, he'd been escorted out of the lunchroom for flipping out on his then-girlfriend for talking to another guy. 
So when word got out about Matthew being the last person seen with Lee, many wondered what could have happened between them. The two were complete opposites, with Lee being an honor roll student and Matthew being the bad boy type who often found himself in hot water. Some believe the only reason Lee hung out with Matthew the night he went missing was because he enjoyed smoking and was planning to head out for a relaxing smoke session with Matthew at the time. But of course, this is only speculation. Investigators decided it was time to interview Matthew Borges again. During this investigation, Matthew claimed he saw Lee at lunch, spoke to him briefly, and then didn't see or talk to him again until later that evening when they went out for a smoke. Matthew said he didn't even realize Lee was missing until his girlfriend gave him the news, asking him if he'd heard about Lee having gone missing. At this point, investigators were looking closer into Matthew's whereabouts and even noticed he'd had a few cuts on his hands. When asked about those cuts, Matthew said he got into a fight, but then he changed his story, claiming that he hurt himself while attempting to fix his bicycle. Of course, this led investigators to become even more suspicious of Matthew and his potential involvement in Lee's murder. On December 2, 2016, one day after finding the body of Lee Manuel Villoria Paulino, authorities obtained a search warrant for Matthew Borges' residence. While looking through his room, they came across a journal where Matthew had written some pretty dark and demonic things down on paper. They also saw a to-do list that included instructions on how to commit murder and conceal the evidence to potentially get away with committing such a serious crime. After finding this evidence, the police arrested Matthew at his home, charging him as an adult with first-degree murder. The authorities now believed he planned out and committed Lee's murder. The only problem was that they didn't find DNA evidence. The authorities knew they would only have limited evidence to present in the courtroom, including the surveillance footage of Lee leaving his home with Matthew, the journal Matthew kept in his room, and details from the medical examiner on the condition of Lee's body when found in the river. In the aftermath of his arrest, a friend of Matthew's who hasn't been identified reached out to investigators on the case and told them that Matthew did tell him he murdered Lee. The friend claimed that Matthew described what he did to Lee. At this point, investigators also wanted to hear from the other teens involved in the robbery, the ones who'd gone into Lee's home while he and Matthew Borges went to the Merrimack River. The teenagers said Matthew called them and was on speakerphone when he said, I stabbed him over and over again on his stomach, back, and throat because he wouldn't shut up. These individuals also claimed that Matthew said he went for the throat to put a stop to Lee's screams. The defense for Matthew argued that there was no way for one person to commit such a heinous crime within such a short time period. In fact, the defense argued that the other teens must have been heavily involved in this murder and were using Matthew as the scapegoat. The defense stated that by blaming Matthew, these other individuals would get away with murder. Prosecutors say this surveillance video shows Matthew Borges luring 16-year-old Lee Manuel Valoria Paulino away from his Lawrence home back in 2016 so that four other teens could walk in and steal his stuff. Today, two of those young men took the stand to tell a jury they concocted the plan with Borges, but learned after the robbery that Borges murdered and decapitated the Lawrence High School student. He uh, told me that... <clears throat> He killed Lee and um, cut off his head. But Borges' defense attorney argued that both witnesses repeatedly lied to police and lacked detail. You told us that Matthew told you that he's the, he killed Lee. Yes. But you don't know when he told you that. Um, I don't know exactly when, but yeah. You don't know where he told you that. The jury also heard Borges' voice in a recorded police interview conducted a few days before Paulino's dismembered body was discovered. When we left to the river to smoke, after that, it was like 6.30, we were still smoking, and I left around 6.45 to 7. Paulino was never seen alive after that. 
A police detective told the defendant his story seems odd. You yourself said the other day, this story really doesn't sound too good. Jurors will continue to hear Borges' interview with police tomorrow. Then on Friday, they'll take a tour of the Lawrence crime scene. Two years after the crime, Matthew Borges would officially stand trial for the murder of Lee Manuel Viloria Paulino in Salem, Massachusetts. During the trial, most noticed that Matthew showed no emotions at all. Not a tear, not a frown, not even a smirk in the courtroom. It was also during this time that a motive finally came to light. In 2016, at the time of Lee's murder, Matthew Borges had apparently accused his girlfriend of cheating on him with several guys in the area, including Lee. He saw his girlfriend talking with Lee, and it set him off. Now that the trial was in full force, new evidence was presented to the jury, including text messages between Matthew and his then-girlfriend. Matthew told his girlfriend, I think of killing someone. I like the sound of it. The idea of causing pain is all I think about, but I control myself. When I see people I don't like, it comes to mind. Despite sending these concerning text messages to his girlfriend, she didn't respond. The trial lasted eight days, with the jury deliberating only nine hours before finding Matthew Borges guilty of premeditated first-degree murder. When he received the verdict, Matthew appeared emotionless. The defense attorney stated that those involved in the burglary were facing no criminal charges, which should be a cause for concern, considering they broke into the home and stole Lee's belongings. He also stated they would be appealing the verdict. As a result of Matthew's conviction, he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 30 years. Many still have questions about this case, including how a 15-year-old boy could be so cold and callous enough to commit such a horrendous crime. Matthew Borges, on indictment number 2017-115. The jury having returned a verdict of guilty on the charge of murder in the first degree on the theories of deliberate premeditation and extreme atrocity and cruelty, you will hearken to the sentence the court has awarded against you. The court, having duly considered your offense, it is ordered by the court that you be punished by confinement for a term of life with parole eligibility on the theory of extreme atrocity and cruelty at 30 years and parole eligibility on the theory of deliberate premeditation at 30 years to run concurrent, and that this sentence is to be executed upon you in and within the precincts of the Massachusetts Correctional Institution at Cedar Junction, and that you stand committed in execution of this sentence. So, what are your thoughts on this case? Do you believe Matthew Borges acted alone during the attack against Lee, or do you think others were involved? Thank you all for joining us on this gripping journey through the darkest corners of the human psyche. If you enjoyed this video and want to uncover more spine-chilling tales, be sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. You won't want to miss a single episode. Remember, truth is often stranger than fiction, and our mission is to bring you the untold stories that lurk in the shadows. So, make sure you're subscribed to our channel to stay up to date with our latest investigations, in-depth analysis, and shocking revelations. Furthermore, if you have a thirst for more mysteries and unsolved cases, we've curated a playlist of our most compelling episodes just for you. Click on the screen to dive deeper into the dark abyss of human nature and explore the enigmas that continue to perplex us. Lastly, we want to express our deepest gratitude to our incredible community of true crime enthusiasts. Your passion, engagement, and comments fuel our determination to bring you the most compelling content. Together, we stand as seekers of truth in the face of darkness. As we conclude this chapter, remember to stay curious, stay vigilant, and stay safe.